And are we ready to go Facebook Live? Are we doing that? Yeah, we are ready. Oh, great. Super. <laughs> well, let's jump right in. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fabulous Friday TV. Thank God it's Friday, but today I encourage you to say, thank God I'm fabulous. Fabulous Friday is all about celebrating fabulous, living fabulous, being fabulous, and feeling fabulous. I'm Sherry Kalurgis here in Vancouver with At 45, the magazine for women when life changes, and co-founder of Fabulous University. <laughs> And I'm Anne Merritt uh, from South Africa. I'm the founder of Women Connect, elite membership for women who want to empower themselves, get themselves upskill all in one place. And I'm also the co-founder of Fabulous University alongside Sherry. Back to you, Sherry. So Anne and I are feeling so blessed today that you're taking time in your busy schedule to join the show. We have uh, women from all over the world. So some of you are getting up early. Others you, of you are just celebrating the end of the day. And we're having such a fun time connecting with you. Uh, we're always searching for speakers and prizes and subjects that interest you and that will add to your fabulous life. So make sure and reach out to us. Let us know what you're thinking about, what's on your mind. Um, and if you're having a great time on the show, please invite a friend to come along and share with you. So our show is broadcast live on our Facebook channel, as well as um, it's posted on YouTube uh, the next week. So make sure when you're sharing that uh, what you're sharing is appropriate for uh, putting out in the in universe. Uh, Today, we are talking about menopause, uh, navigating midlife years uh, and perimenopause all the way to menopause with confidence, ease, and ease, peace and ease. Oh, good grief. Today, our speaker is going to help us break open the conversation. And I can tell you that it needs to be done because talking about menstruation and menopause was taboo in my mother's day. And I remember the most uncomfortable conversation about the birds and the bees, but menopause was never a conversation between my mother and I. And I'd like to think that, you know, we women of today are much more sophisticated. Uh, after all, we're the ones who broke the chains of sexual repression, we created the era of sexual uh, freedom, and we've made huge strides in equality in the workplace. So we should be open to embracing and talking about the natural cycle of womanhood. Uh, yet, sadly, we're not. Um, a few weeks ago, you'll remember, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, remember that a member of the royal family, Sophie Wessex, made news around the world. And one headline blared, Sophie Wessex opens up about her menopause experience. It feels like a shackle. On one hand, it's great that she took the steps to normalize the conversation, uh, but we will have made it when talking about menopause no longer makes the news. So it gave me a pause for thought because I think that we have actually bought into some of the stereotyping around menopause. And uh, it, it came up even as we were posting about uh, the show this week. Uh, you know, uh, we used a fan uh, sort of joking about the hot flashes and we used the word, word struggling. And what it got me thinking about is I, I remember I was like uh, in a male dominated industry, both the steel industry and education. And I can remember countless times about the jokes when someone was sweating how, you know, they were suffering from hot flashes. And so it just got me thinking that really uh, we are accepting some of the, the stereotyping and, and so we need to do something about it. Now, what I can say about my menopause experience 
is that it was a non-starter except for the hot flashes. Uh, they started early, like in my early 40s, and it wasn't until about, a, I think I was about 60 before I could sleep without a fan on me at night. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just curious, Anne, what is the approach to talking about menopause like in South Africa? Is it any different? <laughs> I was just thinking, does it differ, does it differ uh, depending on which country you're in? <laughs> well, I think it does because there are some cultures who, who this, it, it's a wide open discussion. And I think our speaker is yeah. going to talk about that. Yes, no, absolutely. Look, it's, I think it's very much the same. I think it's more of um, um, a woman thing rather than a, than a culture thing. But, um, but it's, it certainly is for me, I think, you know, it's such a pity that we don't feel comfortable talking about these things. Uh, personally, I, I had had no problem uh, with talking about anything, actually, you know me, Sherry. <laughs> but I um, do. <laughs> yeah, but at the end of the day, I was one of the lucky ones as well. Mine started when I was about 47. And I think by, well, I think 51, 52, it was over. So, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing. I, I remember in those years, I was doing a network marketing company, uh, then, and I brought the American, American product over to South Africa. And it was a collagen protein product. And I think it must have been um, because of these, this product that I never really went through much stress in, in menopause. And um, I did experience the hot flushes and the, and the nights the night sweats, but it was not a big thing, you know, that I didn't actually struggle with it. So I think it, it was um, because of this amazing product that I was taking, but um, yeah, I'm so glad and uh, that surely that you're here today. Um, and I I'm, I'm can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. And I'm so glad that we're airing this live as well on Facebook so that everyone that who is out there can join in if you haven't come through on the Zoom. Um, because I think this is a really important topic for us to, to approach. And um, yeah, so I hand it back to you, Sherry, so we can get on with it. Yeah, let's dive right in. So today, Shirley Weir is with us and she introduces herself as the menopause chick. Now 54, her perimenopause journey began more than 10 years ago. Uh, sore boobs, sleep deprivation, depression and brain fog led Shirley to her doctor's office, the bookstore, and of course, Dr. Google but she was left feeling confused, overwhelmed, and alone, which I think a lot of us can identify with. At 46, she launched Menopause Chicks onto the world stage to empower women to confidently navigate midlife health information and to be their own best health advocates, which is so important. Shirley moder uh, moderates a private community with 35,000 members who regard the group as trustworthy and the go-to place to get their questions answered to affirm that they're not alone. And in 2020, the group generated over 2 million site visits. And, but that doesn't surprise Shirley as her research shows that 77% of women have questions about some aspect of their health. And more than 70% of women state they don't have anyone to talk about perimenopause or menopause. So it's a big question. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so do you want to ask me questions or do you want me to just dive in? <laughs> I think just dive in because you know the subject so intimately. I do, I do. So I, first of all, I applaud you for putting this subject on the agenda because that's super important. And then I quickly go to a place of saying, talking about menopause is not enough. And so when I launched Menopause Chicks uh, nine years ago, it was a blog because everyone was blogging back then. And that was, that was going to be my gift to the world. And then I was going to go back to my regular scheduled life. Um, I had a business and two small kids. And um, I quickly realized that talking about menopause wasn't going to be enough. And the real gaps 
was uh, existed in all of the misinformation, myths, confusing, conflicting information. And that's why I say talking about menopause is not enough because we don't have to look very far to um, find misrepresentation of women who are navigating midlife. Um, media, marker, marketers, the medical community, like doctors even, who we, you know, we know, like, and trust might say things to us. You could even step outside right now onto the sidewalk and put a microphone in someone's face and say, what's, tell me the first thing you think of when I say the word menopause. And before they answer, you are likely to see that thought bubble rise above their head and they are going to be thinking hot, tired, old, bitchy, fat, suffering, gray haired woman holding a fan. I mean, that's if you go into, if you type menopause or perimenopause into Google right now and click on images, I know the exact pictures you're going to get back. And please understand, I have nothing against gray haired women, but the message, the gap that we're trying to fill in really clarifying information, which we'll get to in a second, is that if we continue to put those images and those words out into the marketplace, media, for our next generation, my daughter, who's going to turn 18 this summer, her and her friends are going to continue to grow up and think that menopause means suffering, that menopause means old, menopause means I don't have to worry about it until I'm in my 50s or 60s or beyond, that the first sign of menopause is hot flashes. I'm here to tell you that all those things are not true. Um, So, Let's get to some definitions. Uh, Menopause is one day. It is only one day on the calendar. It's the 12 month anniversary after you haven't had a period for 12 consecutive months. If you go six months without a period and then you get it again, that's perimenopause. If you go eight months without a period and you get it again, that's perimenopause. And here's the thing, perimenopause The word and the concept was only coined in 1996. So that makes it a really, really new term. And it also helps explain a little bit. I think I see some nods on the screen here right now. It helps explain why there's so much confusing and conflicting information. So my own story is I reached menopause at age 49. At age 48, I went 10 months without a period. I went away on a girl's weekend, of course, because it always happens when you're traveling. I went away on a girl's weekend. I was in the van with six of my girlfriends and I thought, you know what? I'm going to announce it. Hey, girls, I'm planning a party. I'm inventing a cocktail. I'm going to have a celebration to mark menopause because no one does that. And if we really want to change how the world perceives this phase of life, I'm going to have a party. That night in the hotel, got my period and started counting over again. So I reached menopause at age 49, but my journey began 10 years prior. So at age 39, I do recall the very first change that I noticed in my own body was sore breasts. And it felt like to me that I might be pregnant, even though that was an impossibility. But then when you think back, for those of you who have been pregnant, you remember, oh, hormones fluctuate and your body responds to those hormone fluctuations. The exact same thing happens in perimenopause. So perimenopause does not mean symptoms and it doesn't mean suffering. Perimenopause simply means 
around. The word peri means near or around menopause. It actually is the phase of life leading up to menopause. Um, and it's marked by hormone fluctuations, but those hormone fluctuations can or cannot lead to uncomfortable symptoms. Um, and I think that's really important because I have a lot of women in the menopause chicks community who are like, oh, I'm not there yet. Then they put a hand out and, you know, in my face, go, oh, I don't need to talk about that yet. I'm not there yet. And it's like, what they're saying is I'm not suffering yet, but I expect to suffer. And if we can back that up and help women understand ourselves sort of meeting women where, where we are right now, but also younger uh, women in our lives, if we can help them understand the concept of hormone balance and taking care of our hormone health, um, we can eliminate the possibility that they're going to suffer. So it's, you know, it's a preventative opportunity. It's an opportunity to invest. So what else do I want to tell you? Um, ages, I think are really important uh, because there's a misconception, you know, oh, I don't need to worry about this. I don't need to learn about this topic until I'm 50. And that's like so untrue because of course I was 39. Oh, and I didn't finish that part of the story, but you know, it went away the sore breast went away. And I was like, Oh, that was weird. But then when I was 41, I was faced with sleep deprivation, brain fog, PMS for the first time in my life, anxiety and depression for the first time in my life. And I was actually starting to worry that I had early onset dementia. And I kind of want to laugh when I say that, but I can tell you, and I'm sure that many of your listeners are, you know, maybe feeling that right now too. Women are scared of brain health. They're scared when they start to forget things or their inability to concentrate. And my inability to concentrate was severely impacting my quality of life. I'm self-employed. I had two small children. My aging mother had moved in with us and she was showing signs of dementia. And here I was in my early forties, scared to death that I was actually starting to forget things. Now I look, I went looking, first of all, I did mention menopause to my doctor and she told me I was too young and she offered me, and I love my doctor. Like she's amazing and a really, really important member of my health team, um, delivered both my kids. I went in there thinking this is going to be an amazing conversation. And she offered me the birth control pills, sleeping pills and Prozac and antidepressant. And I knew that those weren't things that really resonated with my health values or what I really thought was going to come out of that conversation. Um, so that's what sent me to Dr. Google, as Sherry mentioned. And what I found there was there was such a lack of go-to resources for women that they could trust that the information had been curated and validated by evidence-based research and by health professionals who have actually studied perimenopause. There's not that many, I'm telling you, um, studied perimenopause and studied hormone balance. So that's what led to a career, a midlife career change for me. And I have been, um, I launched the blog nine years ago and I've been working full-time on menopause chicks for the last five years. Our mission is to empower women to navigate perimenopause to menopause with confidence and ease. And that doesn't mean that you might not experience health concerns that will affect your quality of life. It doesn't give you a get out of jail free card, but I know from the experience that I now have that if we can shorten the distance for women between where they are and how they can access quality information and education, that we can change their quality of life. If we can help bridge that gap 
if we can help um, bridge the gap for them to find health professionals to support their journey. That's amazing. And then the other thing that we do is it we have a community of women who have each other's back. And, um, you know, as you talked about in the intro as well, how important is it for a woman who's maybe lacking the conversation growing up with her in her family or in her cohort of friends, lacking quality health information, um, to find a community where someone says, hey, you are not alone. I can validate your experience. Oh, by the way, I drove away and left my suitcase at the airport too. So don't worry, you don't have dementia. You probably have too much on your plate. It's probably stress related. That's a true story, by the way, just one of the many things that I did in my mid forties. Oh, right. Suitcase. Yes. It's still spinning around on the carousel. I should go back and get that anyway. Um, Yes, and please um, jump in with questions at any time because I'm happy to, I mean, I want to address the questions that you have and make sure that in the time we have together, um, it, so pop it into the chat and I'm happy to do that. And I think that's really important, Shirley. I probably didn't say that at the beginning, but to all our listeners, either in the Facebook Live or uh, on, the, on the Zoom today, feel free to put questions in the chat to share things that um, you're curious about or experiences that you want to share and we'll make sure that um, Shirley uh, is able to answer the questions either at the end of the show or we'll reach out to you after. So most thanks, definitely, Shirley. most definitely. 77% of women have questions about their health. 70% of women don't have anyone to talk to about perimenopause or menopause. Th those are big glaring numbers. In my mind, those numbers are too big. 31% uh, of women don't trust online information and 35% of women don't trust their doctors. So we have some significant gaps to fill. Um, so I talked about how menopause is misrepresented in the media by marketers, uh, and definitely, you know, in some corners of the medical community. Um, the other thing that, you know, we talked about this week in the article, you know, we talked about elephants in the room. One of the things that I found is that no one really owns menopause. Like I could say parenthood, for example, to you, and you might just immediately think, you know, Pampers and Procter and Gamble, and they portray in all of the work that they do a really positive experience around parenthood. But if you go and look at the imagery that we deal with, with perimenopause and menopause, like it's all negative. It's women holding their head in their hand, looking depressed. It's women sitting on the side of the bed with their partner in the background. And, you know, the thought bubble is she doesn't want to have sex with me anymore. All of these images we have grown up with, and it has helped like even generational myths that we've um, inherited from our mothers or grandmothers, it's perpetuated this story, this narrative around menopause that we're meant to suffer. And I am here to tell you the one thing that absolutely changed my life was my very first day of research. And I went to a free um, information event uh, by a local physician here in Vancouver. Her name is Dr. Bal Pawa, and she's a co-author on my book. Um, and I went there, new notepad, new pen. I was like, I am here to learn everything I can about estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And I am going to become this hormone expert for myself and then see what I can do for the rest of the world. And she stood up and she said, at the turn of the last century, women lived to be 50. So menopause was a non-event. And you can think about that, right? Our bodies were actually designed to have babies at 18, 19, early 20s. Women were done having their families at age 30, and they died at age 50. Now, fast forward 100 years, we expect, like we really expect 
to live to be 85 to 100. But evolution hasn't caught up. So we still reach menopause at 51.2. That's the average age in North America. And then we turn to our bodies. Hey, body, we're like, I I expect you to do the exact same job that you did for the first 50 years, but I'm not, you don't have the same equipment, the same hormone levels, the same ingredients to do that job. And that's not fair. Um, So until evolution catches up, we have this situation where the statistics around heart disease and stroke, dementia, osteoporosis, and vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy are too high. They're exploding. And no one is really, I mean, when was the last time we took a health class? Grade seven? But I think you alluded to this too, Sherry. It's like, remember the health class where the teacher said, like, this is how you make a baby. And then we're going to tell you how not to get pregnant. And that was the end of that. That was the end of health class. And then fast forward 40 or 50 years, no one has actually taught us about the mechanics of hormone health. And as a result, I'm sad to say we have women waking up in their mid to late 40s. I was maybe a little bit earlier. We have women waking up in their mid to late forties, thinking that they're dying because of the, you know, heavy bleeding is one of the most common experiences of perimenopause as hormones shift. Um, so a little bit of a hormone health lesson, uh, in the first, when you, when your period is normal in the first two weeks of your cycle, estrogen is the dominant hormone. And estrogen is strong and it's feisty. It's also the hormone that's responsible for keeping everything juicy. So it keeps our skin supple, our eyes moist, our mouth moist, our joints moist, keeps our vagina moist. Um, And then in the second half of the cycle, progesterone comes in like that long awaited dance partner on the dance floor. And it just comes in and it provides balance and calm and it supports our mood and it supports our sleep. And also progesterone is a hormone that's responsible as an investment in our brain health and in our bone health. And when in, uh, in perimenopause, when hormones start to fluctuate, so they can come apart a little bit, the teeter totter ride, not that bumpy, you sail through, comes too far apart. And women start to notice thing, things like PMS for the first time, irregular bleeding, heavy bleeding, sleep disruption, mood swings. If it goes too far, and I experience this personally, it can even lead to bouts of rage where you're like literally losing your mind with the people that you love the most. And That was me. And it was a turning point when I had two tweens um, and I was coming unglued with them. And I wasn't really being the mother that I had always aspired to be. And so it motivated me to lift the hood, find out what was going on and address my own health um, so that I could be the parent that I wanted to be. I didn't know at the time it was going to change my career anyway. Um, who has questions? <laughs> um, well, so yes, I have a question for you, yeah. Shirley. Thank you. It's been so wonderful, and you've got such a good response on the on the chat. Um, so uh, I have one personally, but I'll ask Monica's first. Um, what about women who have had a hysterectomy right. and still have the ovaries? I have no idea when menopause starts. Yeah. Okay. Great question. And I should have included that when I talked about the definition of menopause. Um, so my, the definition I gave was for natural menopause, but if you have a hysterectomy, um, your menopause, if you have a full hysterectomy with the ovaries removed, the date of menopause is that day. It's the day of your surgery. And then you're in post-menopause for the rest of your life. If you don't have your ovaries removed, it's a partial hysterectomy and you will 
continue. Um, your ovaries will continue to produce hormones, but maybe not at the same level. I am told that women who have a partial hysterectomy can often reach menopause sooner. Now, it doesn't really matter when you reach menopause. It's an interesting question that I get asked, when will I reach? How will I know? And I, I, I always come back and say, there's really only one reason to know when we reach menopause and that is birth control. Remember how I said it's the one, it's one date on the calendar. The day that you reach menopause is really just important for you to know if you are making birth control decisions. And of course, if you've had a partial hysterectomy, you're not making birth control decisions because your uterus has been removed. Um, now, that's a little bit of a, a tongue in cheek answer because there are other reasons, of course, to know when you reach menopause. But I say that because I don't want women to think, oh, I have to wait. Oh, I'm not there yet. Oh, this must be something else. My sleep dis disruption or my mood changes is the result of something else. I really want us to flex our curiosity muscle and to get really curious about our health. Women have been told forever to expect pain, to expect suffering, to expect, you know, PMS or period pain, or it's just part of being a woman. And if we continue to put that message out into the world, women will continue to put their health on the back burner instead of on the front burner where it belongs because we deserve quality of health. And the reason for that, I want you to connect to the fact that not paying attention to hormone fluctuations and changes in your health in your late 30s, early 40s and beyond could have a significant impact on your heart health, your brain health, your bone health and your vaginal health for the next three to five decades. And that is the piece of information that really is missing in all communication around menopause. We look at it as if it's this one dimensional, every woman goes through it. Gosh, I hope I don't suffer. I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope these hot flashes go away. And we're missing the opportunity to understand or to help women understand that estrogen plays a protective role in our heart health. And what's the number one reason for premature death with women? Heart disease and stroke. Or we're missing the opportunity to say, do you understand the importance of progesterone? I often hear uh, for, for women who um, are pursuing hormone therapy, who are on hormone therapy, oh, I don't need progesterone. My doctor told me I don't need progesterone because I don't have a uterus anymore. And then that is kind of true because one of the reasons for progesterone is to protect the lining of the uterus. But we're missing that piece about progesterone being a really important hormone for our brain health and our bone health. And so, Shirley, so uh, do you have to take this as a supplement or does the body produce that? Good question. So yes and yes. Um, I want you to pursue or get curious or inquire about whether hormone therapy is an option for you, but that's not your first step. So I use an image of an inverted pyramid when I talk about hormone health. And I, the first layer of that, the widest part of the pyramid is paying attention to how we eat, move, sleep, and manage stress. And sometimes I say those uh, too fast, but they're, I'm slowing down because they are big, important subjects. So paying attention to how we eat, move, sleep, and manage stress supports our hormone health. And doing that can play a significant role in your journey and navigating this phase of life with more confidence and ease. Backing up to my story, remember I was 41, going to my doctor saying, I think I'm showing the first signs of menopause. 
I can now tell you as I reflect back on those years, I was burnt out. I was waking up every morning at 3 a.m. thinking I was gifted, that I could work for four hours before my kids woke up. And I did that for years. And then I hit a wall and then I kept going through that wall. And it might have been hormone imbalance as a result of perimenopause. It is more likely burnout. And it's one of the reasons why I include burnout um, as a definition in my book. Um, da moving down the pyramid. So I'm trying to answer your question about um, whether or not you want to uh, supplement or does the body do it on its own? The answer is both. The body can do it on its own, especially if you're really taking care of yourself at those top rungs. The neck, the middle section, which is equally important, is that at certain ages, there are nutritional deficiencies that even mimic hormone imbalance. So one of the most common nutritional deficiencies is iron. And women um, who have a period who are still menstruating, 90% uh, of women who still have a period are iron deficient. And what are the symptoms of iron deficiency? Fatigue, exhaustion, pale skin, brain fog. Remember I mentioned brain fog? I wanted to blame perimenopause. I was also iron deficient because I don't eat. I eat primarily a vegetarian and vegan lifestyle. Um, hair loss is something that comes up a lot in the menopause chicks community. And unfortunately, women will think, oh, and now I have hair loss. This is just part of being a woman. And they don't realize that it, they're potentially, you know, the first thing that they could be checking is iron deficiency. Um, another important um, nutritional question to be asking is around magnesium. So magnesium is something that's really, really hard to get uh, quality and quantity from our diet. So it does require a supplement and magnesium acts like progesterone to your question. So it is calming, it's balancing, and it supports our sleep. It also helps with uh, joint pain, restless legs. Um, so almost, I mean, my doctor says the first three things you should do as you're navigating this journey is take magnesium, take magnesium and take magnesium. Um, she's a huge advocate for that. So again, if we're not looking, you know, getting the education and information that we need, and we're not looking at hormone health as this pyramid of, I need to take care of myself no more, you know, drive through meals, no more burning the candle at both ends, staying up all night, um, really practicing stress management um, strategies, mindfulness, meditation, those kinds of things, then looking at nutrition, that might be enough for you. And to answer to ask, you know, to address your question, um, does the body do it on its own, that might be enough. But you need to know that the next level on the pyramid is hormone therapy. And I have been using hormone therapy uh, for five years. It's my personal choice. I sat down with my health team and said, I'd like to know what the benefits are. We went through a risk assessment. It's a choice that I made. And I look at it as an investment. I mean, not only in my health now, which I totally need and value, but also looking forward to the next uh, five decades. My sister, I also have her experience and wisdom to help guide me. Uh, my sister is 10 years older than I am. She reached menopause at age 36 because she's a childhood cancer survivor. And so the, we believe that her radiation treatments as a child uh, destroyed most of her egg follicles. She uh, reached menopause at 36, started hormone therapy then and continued hormone therapy for 30 years. And she is now a healthy 65 year old. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so thank you for that. And um, so I just want to know as well, the um, 
a lot of people say that when you go through, I mean, I had no problems with menopause. In fact, the only reason why I knew I had it was I did experience some hot flushes, as I said earlier on, and I also experienced some, some night sweats, but it, there was nothing else that would have told me that I had, that I had past my menopause, you know, date or experiencing menopause, as you said, it's only one day really after 12 months. Um, and, um, but a lot of people, if, you know, you see them saying that they, uh, they start putting on weight. Now, could you maybe touch around, touch on around that, especially the, the middle part of your body? So I, <laughs> you nailed it. Um, I, hear from women a lot around the topic of weight and weight management. It's not something that I address in the menopause chicks community. And the reason is, is because I am attempting to foster a healthy at every size and shape community. Um, I just actually at sidebar, but there's a great book out called burnout, um, by Emily Nagoski and her twin sister, Amelia. And, uh, and she has great statistics in that book that talk about that. We are actually healthier when we are five to 15% above that normal, uh, weight that whatever the institution sets the guidelines, then we're healthier than if we are 5% under that weight. Um, so I think that's really important. The second thing that I would say about that is that hormone fluctuations are going to affect your weight. And women will often say to me, I do exactly the same thing that I've always done. I haven't changed my eating and I haven't changed my exercise routine, but I'm putting on weight. And it's like, that's right because you are going through uh, perimenopause to menopause and beyond, you can't do the exact same thing you've always done. Our thyroid, um, which is responsible for our metabolism, um, that's something uh, that I missed on the hormone pyramid that you should definitely check. Um, is it a thyroid issue? Um, or is it hormone fluctuations, in which case, um, can you invite a health team member, either a registered dietitian or a, um, uh, you know, a physical activity expert to help tweak your routines to match where your body is? And, um, and then finally, the, my final words of wisdom, if I can pass them on, is that as we gain weight, there is more of us to love. <laughs> well, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. And can and so if, if any of the ladies want to follow through and have a look at what Shirley is um, is passing on, communicating through her website, Shirley, it's um, menopause men, menopause chicks. Is that correct? Sorry, I don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, so it's at at menopause chicks on all social media, and the community is menopausechickscommunity.com. Awesome. Thank you. It's just been fascinating. So I have another question because you mentioned it earlier and I know it's been a conversation in my social circle about okay. the fact that, uh, you know, it, it is more difficult to have sex. Your sex mm -hmm. drive seems to go down. How does that relate to your, um, what you were mentioning about? Hormones? Yep. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, in 2016, I spoke at a world international menopause day event and they, uh, they had a, like a game show. Um, and I was like one of the judges. And so one of the questions came up in this game show and it was, is there sex after menopause? And, uh, my answer to that question is yes. Sometimes even with a partner. <laughs> um, <laughs> so seriously, hormone fluctuations, uh, can affect our libido or sexual desire. Um, I work with a, a doctor here in British Columbia, Dr. Lori Brado, who studies women's sexual desire. She has taught me um, that the word libido is actually outdated um, because it portrays that women either have it or they don't. And the reality is, is that sexual desire is a sliding scale. 
it's a sliding scale like happiness or sadness or grief or anything we might be experiencing in life. And some days we're a two or a three and other days we are a six or a nine. And uh, I really relate to that, you know, because the thing is midlife women are holding up the world right now. They are taking care of families and no more, I mean, no more is that phrase poignant than having lived through 15 or 16 months of a world pandemic, right? Um, Women are taking care of families. They're taking care of aging parents. They're working. They're the volunteers in our community. They're advocating. So women are holding up the world and women's sexual desire is so different from a man's. Um, Not better, not worse, just different. Dr. Dr. Balpawa, who I mentioned earlier, she has a great analogy, whereas um, she talks about men's sexual desire is a light switch. Walk over to the the wall, flip the light switch on, turn it, bring it down, off. For women, sexual desire is like stepping into the cockpit of a 747 airplane. Just imagine all those bells and whistles and lights and gadgets. And so we're making to-do lists while we're having sex, right? And it's <laughs> it's affecting the quality of our sexual health. Um, but the reason why I share that story is because both those professionals that I just mentioned, and you can watch videos from them on my YouTube channel, um, Dr. Brado and Dr. Pawa, they really, really emphasize the importance of stress management and the benefit of mindfulness and meditation practice practices on women's sexual desire. It can be a game changer. Um, the other point about sexual health that I want to make is around vaginal dryness. Um, And this was something that was brought to me by my community. Women were asking for solution uh, about for vaginal dryness. Um, And here's why 80% of women will experience vaginal dryness post-menopause. So we've talked a lot today about fluctuating hormones in perimenopause then you reach menopause, then you're in post-menopause for the rest of your life. What happens after menopause is estrogen goes for a deep dive. It does decline in post-menopause. And that's, you know, remember I said it was a juicy hormone. So that's why our eyes get drier and our mouth can get drier. And sometimes our joints will creak as we bend down to get, you know, clothes out of the dryer or whatever. And we're like, I never I used to be able to do this, no problem. Um, And it's the reason for vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy. Really, really important for your listeners to know is that vaginal dryness does not get better with time. So sleep might get better, moods might level out, hot flashes will eventually go away, but vaginal dryness does not. So it does need some attention. Your body needs some attention, not only for sex, but to be able to sit comfortably, to move comfortably, to go to yoga, to dance, um, to ward off urinary tract infections, to support healthy pelvic health so that um, you don't experience organ, pelvic organ prolapse. Um, And did I say, and to have sex comfortably. Um, So there's lots of solutions. Suffering in silence is not one of them. Uh, One of the solutions is practicing regular pelvic floor exercise, uh, kegels or kegels, working with a pelvic floor physiotherapist to support you in that. Um, Localized estrogen therapy is proven to be effective at treating vaginal dryness. Uh, What you might not know is that it can take three to four months to show results. Um, And that's important because, I mean, it makes sense because we've been possibly without estrogen for way longer than that by the time we seek treatment. Um, But lots of us have this mentality that, oh, if it's broken, this will fix it. And it's not always a magic wand or a quick fix. 
the other thing that happens at menopause is that hyaluronic acid which is a molecule our body produces on its own, uh, it also goes for a deep decline in postmenopause. So um, the menopause chicks community has a vaginal moisturizer um, that's compounded by a local pharmacist. It doesn't have any additives or preservatives. It, it's hormone free as well. Um, and it's hyaluronic acid and a little bit of vitamin E and women are using it preventatively they're using it as a solution for vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy. And they're using it. Some, some of them are using it in combination with estrogen therapy. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that as well. Oh, well, it's just fascinating. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was so informative. You were absolutely wonderful. And just so you know, when uh, on the YouTube recording, we will have your websites and everything. So people, so women can go go to you if they, they need further information. It's a big subject. It's yeah. a big subject. And I just really encourage everyone to get curious and to not make any health decisions based on outdated myths or headlines or hearsay or even memes you know we i don't know how many thousands of memes we all see in a day and if you're making a health decision based on that it's probably time to step away and find you know surround yourself with a health expert that you can um put your name at the top of the to-do list right because it's going to have some long-term benefits absolutely great I, I'm curious, Shirley, what is the most interesting fact you've learned about menopause? I mean, in, in, in all your studies now and, and your knowledge. Oh, whoa. Um, so many, Sherry. Um, there is not a lot of research. There is not a lot of research period on women's health less than 10% of research dollars that go into health goes into women's health. And then you think about women's health and you start breaking that down. I mean, and I said, you know, at the, at the outset, perimenopause, the term was only coined in 1996. So you can imagine really how little research exists on such an important topic for the women who are holding up the world. That keeps me awake at night, to be honest. And then the other statistics just about how, you know, if 70% of women have questions about their health, try to translate, transport that back to, I don't know how many of you have children, but imagine my daughter walking in and saying like, I don't know what's going on here. Like I'm bleeding. No one told me this is going to happen. We are a society that would never let our children now go out into the world without having the age appropriate information ahead of time. Yeah. And that's really good news. Our children are learning about puberty ahead of time. They're learning about sex, sexual health ahead of time. But yet at the other end of the teeter totter, we have these women who are feeling uninformed or misinformed and that gap has to close. Um, it's starting to close, um, but we have a long way to go. I mean, I'm optimistic about the next generation. And I think, you know, we're cracking open the conversation. My goal and my vision is that they will come up and say, ah, now we've got this, we figured it out. Well, and I think that just underlines you know, we've always been taught that, you know, doctors are actually know everything, but it really underlines the fact that we need to be going into our doctor's offices with the idea that we have to advocate for our health because in all likelihood, there isn't, you know, uh, they may be coming from it uninformed. Yeah. Um, Let's have another, let's schedule another date to, to address that. Um, you absolutely have to go to your healthcare team as your own best health advocate, hands down, super important. Do not show up for your health appointment and say, 
I just don't feel like myself today because that's not going to get you to where you need to be. Um, you are walking into a health care model where your time with that physician is 10 to 12 minutes. And there's probably a sign on the back of their door that says only one concern per appointment. That does not meet the needs of women navigating perimenopause to menopause, because what do you pick? I'm bleeding for you know 45 days straight. I haven't slept in three years, you know, like which, which um, note do you pull out of the bucket? And then the other thing that is quite concerning and sad really um, is that we assume that our doctors have been trained in hormone balance and they haven't been. The School of Family Medicine at the University of British Columbia and all other medical schools that I am aware of address menopause for one hour in medical school. So if you are assuming that you, oh, just need to find another doctor, I tell women that doctor sat beside your old doctor in medical school. <laughs> it's not on the curriculum. And the reason that it's not on the curriculum is kind of nuanced. Perimenopause and menopause are not health conditions. They're not ailments and they're not diseases. So your family doctor is learning everything about diabetes, everything about arthritis, everything about heart disease. I mean, we expect our family doctors to know a lot about a lot of, you know, a lot about a lot, a long list of things. And they are taught to prescribe and they're taught to refer you to a specialist. But hormone balance is like, I mean, it's very nuanced and it's specialty. So your doctor may have taken additional training if they have a, you know, a, a personal interest or specialty in women's midlife health. Um, they might be able to refer you to someone who has a specialty training, but it's really up to you to interview your healthcare provider and say to them, what's your education? What's your expertise? What's your experience in working with women my age who have similar health concerns? And that's going to go a long way to getting you to the care that you need. And um, we would all do that if we were bringing on tradespeople to renovate our house. So we need to make sure that we apply that same philosophy and process when we're bringing on health team members to look after our most important asset. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. You have just opened up uh, so many thoughts and, and uh, streams in my mind. And I think everyone in our audience, and we could probably be keeping you on the show for a couple hours and only <laughs> touch the surface of it. But thank you so much for joining the show today, Shirley. Uh, Shirley has got a great article in at45.com uh, uh, this week. And there's some other articles there uh, to support uh, menopause and, and your thoughts around it. So make sure and subscribe to at45.com. Uh, and all the people in our Zoom audience today will be getting an e-copy of uh, Shirley's book, Mokita, How to Navigate Perimenopause with Confidence and Ease. So thank you so much for that, Shirley. And for those of us in our Facebook audience, it's always beneficial to get in on our Zoom call. Uh, you can sign up for it at, at uh, fabulous. FridayTVShow.com. Is that right, Anne? Have I got That's it right? <laughs> That's correct. FridayTVShow.com. <laughs> yeah. Super. Thank you. So, so exciting. Yes, and thank you so much, uh, Shirley, for all okay. that information. And I can't wait to get your book. Um, yes, and I'll definitely republish your article in the Woman Connect magazine as well. Thank you so much. That's amazing. So next week, we have another inspiring show for you. Um, it is uh, Embracing Who You Are is a Courageous Act. 
and requires one to find a way through anxiety and a lack of self-confidence or self-love. So let's talk about coming out the other side victorious. And we have Faith Buchanan, founder of Cracking the Anxiety Code, talking about managing uh, anxiety. And Bev Adamo, her aim is as doctor of divinity is to awaken souls to the truth of their unique brilliance. And she manages a Facebook group, uh, Wild and Wise Women with over 300,000 women from around the world. So she's coming at the subject with a, a lot of knowledge too. So have a fabulous week, everyone. It's been a fabulous show. Remember you are fabulous and be fabulous. Thanks everyone.